Hi, my name is Dr. Deborah Sutter. Welcome to my peripheral neuroanatomy course. This video covers the foundational neuroanatomy of the leg. I'm going to present the information relevant to a basic neurological exam. Let's get started. Let's draw the foundational peripheral neuroanatomy of the leg. Let's start by listing the nerve roots. L2, L3, L4, L5, S1, and S2. These nerve roots combine to form the lumbosacral plexus. We don't need to memorize this anatomy, so let's just focus on what nerve roots form which nerves. Let's start by the femoral nerve, which is supplied by L2, L3, and L4. Next, we'll draw the obturator nerve, which is supplied by L2, L3, and L4. Next is the superior gluteal nerve, which is supplied by L4, L5, and S1. And then last is the sciatic nerve. I draw a dot between 4, 5, 1, and 2 because all of these are part of the sciatic. 4, 5, 1, and 2. These form the sciatic, which is actually two nerves in one. This is why I made the sciatic purple, because it divides into red, the tibial nerve, and blue, which is the fibular nerve. The fibular nerve was previously called the peroneal nerve. In the late 90s, the Federative Committee on Anatomical Terminology had a meeting and published the official terminology for anatomical structures. These experts decided to choose fibular nerve as the official name to avoid confusion between the peroneal nerve in the leg and perineal nerve in the groin. It also pairs nicely since you have a tibia and fibula bone in the leg. It makes sense to have a tibial and fibular nerve. Now, let's add our muscles. The femoral nerve innervates the iliopsoas and the quadriceps muscles. The obturator nerve innervates the thigh adductors. This is a little confusing for my brain. I would think that the obturator nerve would innervate the abductors. That's not true. It's actually the superior gluteal nerve that innervates the thigh abductors, specifically the gluteus, medius, and minimus. But it's actually the obturator innervates the adductors. This is a group of five muscles. You don't need to memorize all their names. So for the leg, I just remember that it's the leg is tricky. There's lots of ob opposites. So obturator innervates adductors. All right, so we already mentioned that the superior gluteal nerve innervates the abductors of the thigh. The sciatic nerve innervates the hamstrings. The tibial nerve innervates the gastrocnemius muscle and the fibular nerve innervates the anterior tibialis muscle. This is another confusing area of the leg. I would think that the tibial nerve would innervate the anterior tibialis muscle, but that's not the case. You have to think about what journey this nerve is going on. So here's a leg. There's the thigh. There's the gastroc. Here's the foot. We're looking at the posterior aspect of the leg. So this is our nerve roots four, five, one, and two, coming to form the sciatic nerve, 
If we imagine that sciatic coming down, what's going to happen is the tibial is going to branch off and travel down this posterior aspect of the leg. The fibular nerve branches off, wraps around the head of the fibula, and innervates the anterior compartment of the leg. So that's the memory trick there to remember that the fibular nerve innervates the anterior tibialis muscle. And there you have it, the foundational peripheral neuroanatomy of the leg. Now let's organize this information into a table. I encourage you to take handwritten notes during this portion of the talk. This material is dry, and the act of handwriting helps keep you engaged and improve memory recall. When we're done, reorganize the information in the way that most makes the most sense to you. And let's download this PowerPoint and use it to quiz yourself. I have my table organized by the action that I'm testing, the muscle that performs that action, the nerve that supplies the muscle, and then the roots that comprise that nerve. When I'm doing an exam, I start by testing hip flexion. This tests the iliopsoas muscle, supplied by the femoral nerve, L2, 3, and 4 nerve roots, primarily L2 and 3. Next, I test hip abduction. This tests the gluteus medius and minimus muscles, supplied by the superior gluteal nerve, L4, 5, and S1. Next, I test hip adduction. This tests the thigh adductor muscles. This is a group of five muscles. Supplied by the obturator nerve, L2, 3, and 4 nerve roots. Next, I test knee extension. This tests the quadriceps muscle. Supplied by the femoral nerve, L2, 3, and 4 nerve roots. Next, I test knee flexion. This tests the hamstrings muscle, supplied by the sciatic nerve, L5, S1, and 2 nerve roots. Next, I test ankle dorsiflexion. This is the anterior tibialis muscle, supplied by the fibular nerve, L4 and 5 nerve roots, primarily L5. And then last, I test ankle plantar flexion. This tests the gastrocnemius muscle, supplied by the tibial nerve, L5 and S1 nerve roots, primarily S1. All right, now let's see this in the context of a neuromuscular exam. We'll demonstrate the exam under ideal conditions for someone who can walk and sit on the exam table, as well as demonstrate the supine exam for folks in the hospital. When I'm assessing an ambulatory patient, I ask them to scoot to the edge of the bench and cross their arms and then stand up without using their arms. This is a great test of the iliopsoas, quadriceps, and gluteus maximus muscles. All right, now for the walking exam. When a neurologist is watching someone walk, there's a lot of different components that we're going to be looking for. So first, I'm going to be watching the patient walk away from me. The first thing I want to think about is what's their base. To do this, draw imaginary lines from the hips down to the ground and see, do the feet stay within those lines or are they outside those lines? That's how I tell if it's a narrow-based or a wide-based gait. Next thing I'm going to be looking for is looking at how far the feet are apart from each other when they're stepping. A normal stride length, I should be able to see about a foot length between their feet. If the feet are close together, that's a shortened stride length. So this is kind of what a shortened stride length versus normal stride length is going to look like. I'm also going to be watching the arms of my patient. Do they have normal arm swing? In my Parkinsonian patient, sometimes you'll see that decreased arm swing, as well as that resting tremor can come out. I'm also going to look at how does my patient do on turns. Normally, it should be a step, pivot, step, pivot, keeping their balance. Sometimes with patients with Parkinson's or normal pressure hydrocephalus, you'll actually count and see how many steps it takes to them for them to make a turn. Or in Parkinson's, you have that on block turning, that very blocky turning. I'm also going to be looking at the footfalls, heel toe, heel toe, heel toe. Think about 
patients with a foot drop, they're gonna have that steppage gait. Rather than heel toe, they're gonna be picking up that leg quite high, and then it's toe heel, heel toe, toe heel. That's a steppage gait. Myopathic gait, it's gonna affect that hip girdle. One of the important muscles to think about is that gluteus medius muscle. It keeps the pelvis stable. So when I watch the patient walk away, does that pelvis stay nice and level, or is it falling? Remembering that my right gluteus medius, when I transfer weight here, if it's weak, I'll fall to the left. So that myopathic gait is going to have kind of a waddling quality to it. Also think about our stroke patients. One of those mental shortcuts, stroke patients, they're going to have exaggerated flexion in the arm because the extensors are weak. It's the opposite in the leg, extension at the hip, knee, and ankle. When you watch someone with a stroke walk, you'll notice that because of that spastic tone in their leg, they end up circumducting that leg to help when they're walking. So that's just an overview of the things I'm gonna be looking for as a neurologist. To put it together, when I'm examining someone, I ask them to walk away from me, just their normal walk, like they're walking down the street, turn around, come back towards me, Again, I'm watching that gait, then that arm swing. And then come up on your tiptoes as high as you can, keep those heels off the floor, and then walk down the hall. This is the absolute best way to test the gastroc muscle. When they come back towards me, I wanna watch them walk with their toes up in the air. This is testing the anterior tibialis muscle. Last is gonna be tandem gait. That's where you ask them to watch, walk heel toe, heel toe, like they're walking a tightrope. This tests the cerebellum. So once I'm done watching the patient walk, I'll have them change into a gown and take off their socks and shoes so that way I can inspect the muscles of the leg and the feet. All right, now to do the manual motor testing of the muscles of the leg in a seated patient. So first I'll ask the patient to take their arms and stabilize themselves, yep and lift this knee up to the ceiling. Go ahead, yeah, that's testing the iliopsoas muscle, femoral nerve, L234. Again, I need to think about which muscles am I using versus which muscle am I testing? I don't wanna use my little wimpy wrist flexors. Sometimes when I'm really testing an iliopsoas, go ahead and lift it up. I'll, I'm putting my body weight and not just my upper arm muscles, but my back muscles into testing the iliopsoas. Same on the other side. Next are the thigh abductors. That's the gluteus medius and minimus muscle. That's the superior gluteal nerve, L5, S1, and 2. So next I'm gonna test the hip abductors, the gluteus medius and minimus. That's the superior gluteal nerve, L4, 5, S1. For this, I like to use fists. You can use fists, you can use your hands. I like the fists because that way some patients are a little sensitive to an open hand on their legs. Put your hands on the outside of their knees, yep, and ask them to push apart. Push, push, push. Again, I'm using that firm, constant pressure so I can pick out subtle weakness. Those are the thigh abductors, the glute medius and minimus. Now I can come in here, push in, Oh, that's testing the thigh adductors. That's a group of five muscles, all innervated by the obturator nerve, L234. Next is the quadriceps muscle. For the quadriceps, I like to put my hand on the distal part of the leg to give myself the most leverage as opposed to here. Go here. Stabilize across the knee joint and ask the patient to kick out. Kick, kick, kick. Again. I am pushing my whole body weight into that quadriceps muscle because I really want to pick out that subtle weakness. Go ahead and kick out again. Ah, that's the quadriceps muscle, femoral nerve, L234. Testing the right and then testing the left. Oh. Next is the hamstrings muscle. This is the sciatic nerve, L5, S1, and 2. For this, I grab the back of the leg, mm -hmm, stabilize at the knee, Ask the person to pull, pull, trying to break that hamstrings muscle. It's very strong. Again, I'm using my whole body. 
All right, next I'm gonna test the tibialis anterior. Have the patient, yep, dorsiflex the foot. And I'm gonna apply pressure here. Again, I'm gonna be using my whole body. Tibialis anterior is an extraordinarily strong muscle. This is deep fibular nerve, L4, L5. Next is the gastroc muscle. I put my hand underneath the ball of the foot and ask them to step on the gas. Perfect. That's the gastroc muscle, the tibial nerve L5, S1. So that's the manual motor testing in the leg. So to review, put it all together, iliopsoas, go ahead and lift up, that's femoral, and kick out, quads, both femoral, L2, 3, 4, our abductors, glute medius minimus, superior gluteal nerve, and this, thy adductors, that's obturator nerve, our sciatic nerve, that's L5, S1, 2. Sciatic is gonna do the hamstrings. And then the sciatic here is gonna branch into that fibular nerve. Go ahead and cock that toe up. Fibular, that's the tibialis anterior, specifically the deep fibular branch. And then the tibial, yep, step on the gas, that's the gastroc, L5, S1. Now let's test the reflexes. So for the patellar reflex, you wanna look for the patellar tendon and then do a tap right there. This is testing the quadriceps muscle, L234, the femoral nerve. Whenever I'm testing, I wanna look if there's crossing, crossed adduction. Because it's L234 that covers both the, the quadriceps and the adductors on the other side. Next is the ankle reflex. So for this, I like to support the ball of the foot and then tap on the Achilles tendon, and I'm feeling for that uh, plantar flexion in the leg. This tests the tibial nerve, L5, S1, and S2. Last in the leg, I wanna test the plantar responses, commonly called the Babinski. I'm gonna stand on my soapbox for a minute. So a Babinski specifically refers to an extensor plantar response, that's the abnormal finding. When you're testing a plantar response, you'll get flexor, that's normal, or extensor, that's abnormal. Some people will go and say, oh, the Babinski's negative. That's not technically grammatically correct. When you're checking the plantar response, you wanna lift up the foot and trace a J along the bottom of the foot. You can use a reflex hammer, the, the uh, handle end. You can also use a little stick. Sometimes the stick is a little bit hygienic. I'll even just grab one of those sterile Q-tips with the wooden stick trace that J on the bottom of the foot, and then I'm looking to make sure that the, yep, that I have a flexor plantar response. If someone's positive where they have an extensor plantar response, you'll also see fanning of the toes. So again, I'll do this on the right and then compare to the left. All right, so the neuromuscular exam of the legs in the supine patient, starting with the iliopsoas, what I'm gonna ask the patient to do is bend this knee up, Yep, perfect. And lift this heel up off the bed. Good. Push that, push that leg into my hand. Push it up, push it up. Good. That's testing the iliopsoas muscle. You can also test it too with the legs extended. Yep, keep that, keep that heel off the bed. Whenever you test it this way, make sure that you push just above the knee, not down here, then I'm testing across multiple joints. So that's the femoral nerve, L234. Good, relaxed. And then this side, lift that. Yep, and bend that knee. Bend it in my hand. Good. Yep, and keep that heel off the bed. Good. That's the iliopsoas. Relax. Next is the thigh abductors. I can just put my hands here, yep, and push out. That's the thigh abductors. Glute medius and minimus, superior gluteal nerve, L45, S1. Then again, coming in here. Push in. These are the hip adductors, obturator nerve L234. Next is testing the quadriceps muscle. For this, what I'll do, yep, I'll have the patient just relax for me for a sec, actually. I'll pick up the leg at the knee, pick it up, and then ask the patient to kick into my hand. Kick. This gives me the leverage across the joint, as well as I can use my upper body when testing that quadriceps muscle. Go ahead and kick again. That's L234 femoral nerve. Relax. And then pick up the other leg, kick out. That's the quads on the other side. 
For the hamstrings, similarly, I'm gonna have the patient bend their knee. Good, keep that heel on the bed, keep that heel there. I'm placing my hands to stabilize across the joint and I'm pulling, again, I'm using my whole upper body because this is a very strong muscle to try and see if I can break that hamstrings. That's sciatic nerve L5, S1 and 2. Same on the other side. There's the hamstrings. Next in a supine patient, since the leg's extended, that gives me a little advantage. They aren't using accessory muscles when they're testing ankle uh, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. So go ahead and lift up those ankles for me. Keep it up there. Again, that's the tibialis anterior. I can pull in like this. This is a really strong muscle. You can even wrap your arms around it and hang your body weight off that muscle. Tibialis anterior, this is the fibular nerve, L4-5. Same on this side. And then next, yep, step on the gas. This helps isolate that gastric muscle, tibial nerve, L5-S1. Now to check tone in the legs. What I do is I pick up the leg at the knee, make sure that they're nice and loose, and then I wanna pick it up, again, make sure that it's nice and loose, and then do quick movements. What I'm looking for is I'm watching this heel, seeing if it's dragging along the bed. That's normal tone. If someone has increased tone, you'll see that heel actually pop off the bed. That's spastic tone. Go ahead and relax, checking both sides. So getting that limb nice and loose, and then the quick jerk to really test for any spasticity. Next, we're gonna check for reflexes. So in the supine patient, what you wanna do is pick up that knee and just ask the patient to go loose. I'm just wiggling to make sure that she's nice and loose. Again, looking for that patellar tendon and tapping like this. And again, I'm always looking to see is there any crossing activation of the adductor muscles. So this is how I test the patellar reflex in a supine patient, just like that. For the Achilles reflex, there's a couple different ways to test this. One option is you can actually stretch the foot like this and tap on the ball of the foot. That still gets that muscle stretched to test that reflex. Alternatively, one of the best ways, yep, is to have them bend just like that. Bend at the knee and cross the leg. Yep, it's a little awkward here on the exam table. It's a little easier in the hospital bed. But this gives me good access to that Achilles tendon for tapping. Same for the, uh, the plantar responses. I can just go in here and scrape on the bottom of the foot.